the hour of 10.30 having arrived, I'm going to call to order the Higher Education Finance and Policy Committee. Representative Wogamot, do you have a motion for us? Mr. Chair, I would like to move that we adopt the minutes from our March 21st, 2023 meeting. Representative Wogamont moves the minutes and he was actually at the meeting last time. <laughs> of March 21st, is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay, motion prevails. The minutes are approved. Representative Wogamont, you also have the first bill before the committee, House File 2842. And members, this is a bill that we will keep in possession of the committee. Representative Wogamont, to your bill. Chair Pulowski and fellow members of the Higher Education Finance and Policy Committee, I am pleased this morning to be presenting House File 2842, the Minnesota State Workforce and Economic Development Budget Request. As members know, we already heard this request in committee, but I am pleased to be bringing this request forward in bill form before you today. We all know that the state of Minnesota is facing significant workforce shortages in the coming years. And as our state, dem as our state demographer has stated, even if all those that are unemployed were gainfully employed, we would still have 150,000 vacancies statewide. 150,000. It's clear that we need an all hands on deck approach to addressing workforce shortages in our communities and I'm grateful to Minnesota State for coming forward with a bold ask to move the dial on providing Minnesota's economy of the talent that we need to thrive for years to come. Here's what the bill does, Mr. Chair and members. It funds three workforce areas. Number one, it increases Minnesota State's Workforce Development Scholarship Program by $25.5 million. This program currently provides scholarships of $2,500 per year in high demand areas, including advanced manufacturing, agriculture, healthcare information technology, early childhood education, and transportation. The proposal in the bill adds three additional high need areas, including public safety, construction and education, and expands the eligibility and award amounts for state university students to earn scholarships. The second area that this bill funds is an investment of $49 million to provide students with state-of-the-art equipment and learning environments so students are able to hit the ground running when they enter the workforce. And finally, Mr. Chair and members, House File 2842 allocates $25 million to expand programs in high need areas. And I know that my community, the Greater St. Cloud Development Corporation and the St. Cloud Technical Community College are in conversations to stand up a program to train airline mechanics. But startup costs are expensive. So the funding in this bill would be available to help campuses like those in my community and those in your communities financially when launching new programs like this. That is what the bill funds. That is why I'm bringing it forward. And with that, Mr. Chair, I have a testifier. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mackey, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Um, thank, uh, good morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, Bill Mackey, um, Vice Chancellor for Finance and Facilities for uh, Minnesota State. To the bill or questions, I guess. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Who's going to walk through? I don't think we need to walk it through. I think we've more or less done it. I should ask, though, if any of this deals with car repair, Mr. <laughs> Mackey. <laughs> Mr. Uh, uh, Representative Wogamont uh, lost a tire to one of the potholes last week and has yet to replace it. <laughs> Uh, if the state system has a, a close by car repair, um, he's in great need. <laughs> well, M Mr. Chair, transportation is, is one of the areas that's listed for program eligibility, so we could, we could work on that. Representative Wogamont, I hope you're listening and hit that car repair. <laughs> All the more reason to include this, Mr. Chair. <laughs> right. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Wogmat. Um, I just wondered if you have any data um, about how, how many students have taken advantage of this since it was implemented and how many have actually graduated in the certificate programs or with their degrees. And also, if you could tell me, like, what are the certificate programs covered under this? Vice Chancellor Mackey. 
Um, Mr. Chair, um, Representative um, Robbins, the, the certificate programs would be, um, I believe, adding new eligibility to the scholarship um, program. So we, we don't have historical um, data yet. The workforce development scholarships to this point um, have been for um, degree programs. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that. So what certificate programs will be eligible and how have the graduate programs performed so far? Vice Chancellor Mack. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Robbins, um, the, the certificate programs would be under the, um, per, um, the six existing um, programs of study or certification plus the three additional ones um, that are being proposed, um, construction, education, and public safety. Um, and we can certainly um, follow up with more specific data related to the success. Um, of the current program, but what it has done is it has focused on those those five um, high demand er or six high demand areas based on deed advanced manufacturing, agriculture, healthcare services, information technology, early childhood, and transportation. And institutions have been also able to leverage private um, sources to 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 uh, increase the $2,500 scholarships to their students. So it has helped um, encourage enrollment in those um, high demand areas, which we um, utilize the, the deed data to, to identify to, uh, where to focus those resources. Representative Robin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I, I really <coughs> generally support this program. I think using the deed data to match to our workforce needs is really important. Um, but having the the, the data on how it's going in terms of number of students who have graduated and also the number, the dollar amount of private sector money that's been leveraged would be super helpful as we consider this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, Representative Bogomont, uh, Mackey, thank you. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to present House File 2842. Let's give Minnesota State the resources that it needs to help address our workforce shortage. I move that House File 2842 remain in possession of our committee and that we include it in our, and I ask that we include it in our finance omnibus bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, let's not go down. Mr. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Next on the agenda is House File 2987, Representative Hansen. Representative Hansen, to your bill. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, committee members. House File 2987 is the Minnesota State Request for Stabilization Funding and Student Support. And today, I will not bore you today with justification about why we need this, why people my age and younger especially need this, or why investments in higher education allow my generation and those younger than me to compete on parity with generations before us who paid for their entire college educations with a summer job. Today, instead, I will do a more technical overview and then we'll turn it over to my testifier for more detailed information. There are six components of this bill. The state stabilization is $125 million. Minnesota State is asking for an increase of $125 million for the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities to continue to provide an exceptional education and ensure that there are adequate programs and resources to serve our students. Colleges rely on the state appropriation to cover a significant portion of their general fund operating budgets, and this request would increase the state appropriation at our colleges and universities by roughly 6% each year to help address the inflationary needs. Without increases in general fund revenues, campuses will need to further reduce the breadth of academic programs and student services that are available to students at the same time that these demands have increased. Number two, student supports are 125 million. The components of this student support request include 77 million for a tuition freeze and reducing the cost of attendance, 26 million to expand student supports, 12 million to transfer, for transfer scholarships, and 10 million for emergency grants. Third, the tuition freeze and reduce the cost of attendance is $77 million. Although the colleges and universities at Minnesota State provide the most affordable, equitable, and accessible higher education options in the state, tuition and the cost of attendance remain the key challenges for students and the significant obstacles to their success. 
The Minnesota State uh, Fiscal Year 24-25 budget request includes funding for a tuition freeze for both years of bi the biennium, which is $75 million of the request. This request also includes investments in the open educational resources for high demand fields of study, transfer pathways, and Z degrees. OERs are learning materials that are available in the public domain and are available for students free of charge. Z degrees, or are also known as zero cost textbook degrees for those who don't know, are entire degree programs that can be completed without requiring students to buy a textbook, and that's a $2 million request. And as a student who had to pay so much money for books, I really appreciate that piece of it. Uh, the fourth piece is the expand the student services um, that are available, it's $26 million. So in addition to the traditional students that enroll immediately after high school, state colleges and universities serve students at many different ages, socioeconomic statuses, and with different needs. Many students have challenges outside the classroom that can be barriers to completion, even if they are succeeding in the classroom. And student success should not depend on their background or socioeconomic status. So some examples of student support resources in this initiative would fund additional student advisors, social workers, basic need coordinators, community resource connectors, and mental health support staff. Number five is for transfer scholarships. This request would encourage more students to transfer from a Minnesota State College to a Minnesota State University. Which, uh, and which would help students achieve their educational goals. Transfer scholarships would dramatically reduce the total cost of a degree program. And lastly, it's the emergency grants. Emergency grants are made available to students who experience unexpected emergencies and need immediate access to additional financial support. As proven when federal higher education relief funds were available for this purpose, uh, they can be really vital in helping students stay in school and on track for achieving their goals and make sure that we are stopping our uh, dropout rates and making sure we keep enrollment up. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it over to my testifier. Vice Chancellor Mackey. Um, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, um, Representative Hansen, for, for authoring this, this bill. Um, I, I would um, add is that um, for our colleges and universities, as we shared um, with the committee um, last month related to the um, structural gaps that our colleges and universities would have, even with the full funding of our request, that it's, it's really important um, that the stabilization funding for universities and colleges as well as a fully funded tuition freeze um, relate very closely to one another in, in order to have stable budgets. Having a gap in either area will add to those um, structural deficits that we presented um, earlier. And, and, and as you, you may be aware, uh, you heard earlier in, in, in the committee from our Vice President of Finance at um, Minnesota State University Moorhead that they had went through significant budget reductions recently um, as well as um, since a session has started, um, you may be aware of some of the difficult decisions that have been implemented at um, Bemidji State University. So um, just wanted to reinforce um, those two components and the interrelationship between um, both of them um, in, in the Minnesota State Biennial Budget Request. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Any questions, members? Uh, Representative Colton. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to, to sort of clarify here, the transfer scholarships, that, that's, a new, that's a new program that would be created, correct? Vice Chancellor Mack. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative uh, Coulter, yes, it is a, is a new program. Representative Coulter. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, can you just expand a little bit on this? I'm, I'm just can I, kind of curious how this would work, how um, students would be held, like, uh, I mean, presumably the idea is students transfer from a community technical college to a, 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 um, a university, what, how the accountability piece is there to ensure that that's the case. Can you just tell me a little bit more about how that works? Vice Chancellor Mack. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Coulter, if it's, if it's okay to phone a friend, I have Dr. Jesse Mason, our um, Associate Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs here that could uh, address this very specific question. Welcome to the committee and uh, please identify yourself for the record. Jeff Pulowski, Jesse Mason, Interim Associate Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, Minnesota State Colleges and University System um, Office. Did you hear the question? Yes. Okay. Um, to answer the question um, in reference to, if a, so there's two options to the transfer scholarship. Um, one option, if you graduate uh, within what we call a, um, our transfer pathways, which we have 25 disciplines that are part of that, 
um, and you get accepted into the four year, uh, four year state university, then it pays for that. On the other hand, option two is those who are not a part of a transfer pathway and graduate from one of our community or technical colleges and transfer to those. So it is, it is new, but it also reinforces our commitment to making an easier transfer um, for our students across the state. Just one last quick, uh, just to clarify then, uh, the, the scholarships apply to tuition at the school that the student is transferring to, not the school that they are transferring from. I believe so, yes. Vice Chancellor, that's okay. <laughs> Sounded like that was a yes, just I to clarify. Yeah. Thank you. Representative Coulter. Thank you. Representative Rob. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I have a follow-up question to this. Um, so the students presumably would also be eligible for the state grant program. So this is on top of what they'd get through the general financial aid? Vice Chancellor Mason. Well, I gotta answer it. Uh, well, actually I think it's the last dollar amount because we know that even with Pell eligible in state grants, there is some money left on, there is a, a need based on the students. Um, family contribution expectations. So this would cover those last dollar amount that's not covered. Representative Rob. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, so the purpose of the transfer scholarship, just to be clear, is to cover the family contribution amount? The, the last dollar amount. Vice Chancellor Mason, just to go through the chair, that's okay. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. Go ahead, respond. Yes, Chair Jean Pulaski. Um, it's, it's, I, I, can, I think it is the last dollar amount, um, and no, mostly in financial aid, we look at the family contribution and what's expected because it go by the family income. So I can check on that, but I'm not necessarily sure, but it sounds somewhat accurate. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, yes, if you could provide some follow-up on that, that would be helpful, thank you. And um, I would encourage the follow-up to come quickly. Uh, we're putting the higher ed bill together so numbers matter now a great deal. Representative Cleborn. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I would just like to remind all of us that sometimes when chairs are presenting bills, they forget to go through the chair as well. So, you know, <laughs> we all do it. I know, it's just a reminder. Mr. Chair. Any further questions? Mr. Chair. I'm Representative Davis. You were the chair, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any further questions, members? Seeing none, uh, last word, Representative Hanson. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, committee members. I just wanted to say thank you for hearing this and for considering it. Like I've mentioned before, you know, these types of investments in students are really meaningful. Again, I would not be before you doing the great work I'm doing for my community and for the state of Minnesota alongside great colleagues like this without investments into higher education, just like what this bill proposes. Um, so if you need proof of why this, st this stuff works, uh, feel free to stop by any time and chat. Thanks so much. Thank you. Next bill on the agenda, House File 20, Representative Greenman. I think I saw her come in. There yep. she is. Uh, members, I will move that uh, House File 20 be re-referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. Uh, Representative Greenman, to your bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I do have an amendment. Do you want me to start with that? Um, Let's start with the amendment. Let me find the amendment. First, it's the... Is that A18? 18. A18 amendment? A18 amendment, yeah. All right. I, I will move the amendment and represent agreement to the amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, what this amendment does is it simplifies um, the reimbursement process, uh, turns it um, into a rebate process. It updates the amount of the appropriations in line with the fiscal note, uh, which should be in your packet, um, and it adds a report um, for higher ed to um, report back to the legislature. Any discussion to the amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay. Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Uh, Representative Greenman, to your bill is amended. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members. Um, and uh, this is, it's really nice to be um, in higher education on this bill. Um, House File 20 will end the exclusion of hourly school uh, employees from our unemployment uh, program. Many of you may have heard this bill before. Uh, um, we heard, we uh, traveled through many committees last session. Um, it's been around for a couple of years. Um, and the exclusion 
inclusion is actually 80 years old. This is an important policy that will ensure that the tens of thousands of bus drivers, um, educational assistants, custodial staff, uh, food service workers, and other folks in our uh, workers in our colleges and our university and schools have the same access to unemployment insurance benefits that other Minnesota workers have. This bill is simple. It adds a provision to current law that hourly workers can use their wage credits they've earned to collect unemployment if they're otherwise eligible for unemployment. In other words, it removes the blanket exclusion in current law that prevents hourly workers in our colleges and universities from being able to access unemployment insurance between the academic terms. It also sets up uh, unemployment insurance aid that to support the University of Minnesota, Minnesota State and tribal colleges to reimburse the cost of this policy change. We know that these Minnesotans do amazing work. They are working hard and they are often the lowest paid uh, workers on our campuses. They support, they feed, they drive, and they clean up after and for our students. These workers deserve, always deserve this fairness, but after the last couple of years with the disruptions um, and the hardship, it only increased the need and highlighted the need for this change. And I just wanna highlight a few reasons why I think as a state, it's really important that we do this. First, it is a critical safety net for Minnesotans working paycheck to paycheck to care for, for our students. Most of these folks work year round. Most people need to work year round. And these workers are no exception. Many of them are getting paid around $15 an hour without access to health care and insurance. They're living paycheck to paycheck and working to support their families. Providing this economic security, this safety net uh, for workers who find themselves out of work through no fault of their own is what the system of unemployment insurance is for. It's that safety net that most Minnesotans have access to and everyone should be able to rely on for economic security. This also provides stability for students and our campuses by providing workforce stability. We have a workforce staffing crisis everywhere, including on our institutions of higher education. This means staff, um, shortages of staff on campuses means that uh, there's no staff to provide or shortage of staff to provide transportation, food service, and custodial services that our students rely on. It's stressful for students, for our campuses, and of course for our workers themselves. This current law makes it harder to retain and recruit those workers that our higher institutions rely on. There's really high turnover in these jobs, and a lot of it has to do with if you don't have job security for those three or uh, two or three months out of the year, uh, you may not be able to keep that job and you may go looking for something else. This policy provides stability in the workforce uh, that is really critical to continue to retain and recruit new workers. Last, I'd say it's just the fair thing to do. These are Minnesotans playing critical roles, ensuring our students have access to healthy food, providing a safe and clean environment for our students, transporting them to and from classes. They deserve the same economic security as other Minnesotans, and other Minnesotans in seasonal jobs have access to this unemployment insurance. Uh, this exclusion just applies uh, to these workers. This is a workforce that's majority women of color, uh, women and folks of color, and um, we do a lot of lip service about how important these folks are. Now we need to make sure that they have the economic security. Uh, the last thing I would say is our current law actually treats workers, um, uh, um, employees who have different employees differently. So if you are, if you are a, a employee in food service and you work for um, the university, you are excluded from unemployment insurance. If you're employee in food service and you work for an independent contractor, you have access to unemployment insurance. So at the end of the day, what this is doing is providing the same economic security for our workers as most Minnesotans rely on and ensuring we have fairness in the um, in our law and with that uh, mr. chair I think we have a few workers and testifiers I think you have three people on the list so who do you want to have come first um, mr. chair I've got uh, is it just she I don't have a great order <laughs> welcome to the committee and uh, please identify yourself for the record Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. My name is Jess Schimmick and I am a college lab assistant one at an Oak Ramsey Community College. I've worked there for eight years. I am one of two CLAs in the visual arts department. I specialize in photography in the 2D studios, while my coworker specializes in the 3D studios. 
I am also on the executive board of AFSCME Local 4001, and I'm a stu steward for my campus. Thank you for hearing my testimony today. I am here today to express my support expanding the eligibility of UI to higher ed hourly workers. There were years that I really needed some financial assistance from the state that was not there for me during my summer layoffs. Um, at times, we've done, um, my family and I have done various things to help with that. We sold one of our cars so that we didn't have to pay for gas or insurance on two vehicles, and I instead ride my bike, and I eventually bought a scooter that gets 80 miles to the gallon to help with those bills. Um, we only travel during the school year when I am getting a regular paycheck during the summers. We rarely go far. Um, we can't afford anything too extravagant at that time. The economic security of this bill can be the difference between me making ends meet or taking money out of my deferred comp. I do have a second part-time job shooting real estate photography that I do concurrently with the school year. Usually that works out well because it's not too busy during the school year and I pick up a lot over the summer. However, that's not always the case and that's a whole, the housing market is a whole other can of worms and when the housing market slows down, I can lose nearly all of my summer income. I enjoy photography and I like the flexibility, but it isn't a perfect situation. If I can't count on getting any income from my college or my photography gig, having access to unemployment insurance while I search for another short term job would protect me and my family. I also want to take a quick minute to describe what I do. I know that Mary Falk will be up here um, and talk a bit more about who exactly we are that will become eligible. Um, but to explain what I do, um, I am a very modest person, but myself and my coworker help keep our department running. Um, we deal with all of the studio supplies, we place orders, make sure things are stocked, we make sure that the students are working safely. Um, we make sure that the chemistry for the photo lab, that's my job, is handled correctly. We also have a lot of 3D studios with a lot of sculpture equipment and glass blowing that we make sure that our students are safe for. Um, so we keep things going. We help the students when they have questions and um, listen to them when they need help. So thank you for the chance to testify today. Thank you. Uh, next on the list is Mick Kelly. Welcome to the committee and please identify yourself for the record. Certainly. <clears throat> Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Mick Kelly. I'm a union steward, a uh, member of Local 320 over at the University of Minnesota. And I've been working as a cook at the University of Minnesota for the last 21 years. It's an honor, actually, to uh, be testifying here in favor of Bill 3, uh, pardon me, in favor of uh, House File 20. It's an extremely important measure that workers at the University of Minnesota really, really need. We have a situation at the university where we have 12-month appointments. Many people are expecting to work 12 months a year or something close to it, and the reality is we often come in at something like seven and a half months out of the year, actually, is what we end up working. We need this bill to pass. There's a reality that we have bills to pay, our families to feed, rent to pay, everything else. We have the same expenses as other workers, and the reality is our work is not particularly stable. We need this bill to pass. We see it in terms of staff retention, too. For example, I work at Pioneer Hall, where we uh, serve about 5,000 students a day. And last year, uh, <coughs> the beginning of the school year, actually, Pioneer Hall was part of a national news service, a news story, because we were unable to feed the students on campus along with the other dining halls. Instead, there was Lunchables here and this there, and the reality was long lines and students weren't being fed. And part of that was the low wages. It's hard to get people at low wages, and we were addressing that. But another part of it is the it's not a stable job at this point. We need the committee's assistance in this, and we need you to pass this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, Mary Falk. Welcome to the committee and please identify yourself for the record. 
Good morning, Mr. Chair and committee. Um, thank you for having me here. My name is Mary Falk. Um, I am a vice president with AFSCME Local 4001. And we represent the workers at the majority of the two-year colleges statewide. Um, I've been hoping for this bill to be passed into law for so, so many years. It doesn't affect me personally because I am a year-round employee, but I worry about all our members, and that's what's important. It's about being fair and right for our folks that are the seasonals that in the summer, they don't have any income, and um, it's just not right in my opinion. Um, so um, I'm just going to cover the various job titles that we anticipate will be eligible for um, the benefits if the bill passes and describe what workers the workers do. Um, it's my understanding that most legislators understand pretty well what the K-12 system, what their, the seasonal is there, but the higher education is a little bit less um, known. Um, so I hope this will clarify it. And um, also, these job classifications, it's not everybody that's in those classifications that would that are seasonal to be eligible for this. So it's really a small group of people um, that, but we need to be fair. Um, so the college lab assistants, like Jess just spoke about, and they um, set up the labs, keep the labs safe and clean, order supplies and support the students um, in those labs. Library techs obviously are in the libraries, helping students with um, their needs in media. Food service workers, who are some of our lowest paid workers, um, and they really struggle. Um, office administrative specialists, they, they provide support for deans and faculty at a lot of our community colleges. Um, and then campus security officers. A lot of them are year round, but some of them are seasonal. So um, those are the main, main uh, classifications for those people who would be um, affected, and um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer as I can. Thank you very much. Members, uh, questions to the bill as amended. Representative Cleborn. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I just want to say thank you to um, the man who has pre prepared the meals that my children all, all enjoyed. So um, my children all lived in Pioneer Hall. It's family tradition, so I just wanted to say thank you. And Representative Friedman, I really appreciate you bringing this bill forward. As all of your testifiers have stated today, this is long overdue and much needed. So thank you for your support for our workers and for bringing the bill forward. Seeing no further questions, so I'm sorry, <laughs> Representative Robbins, I should have looked. I wasn't going to get off that easy. <laughs> sorry, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Greenman and your testifiers for bringing this bill. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I'll trying to just stay focused on the higher ed piece. This looks like it's $108 million in a one-time appropriation. Representative Greenman. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair um, and uh, Representative Robbins. If you look at the amendment and the fiscal note, um, it's actually, it's not a one-time appropriation. It's an ongoing. Um, it is um, 800 or uh, 809,000 for Minnesota State um, a year. Um, uh, 366,000 for the University of Minnesota year. And then the Office of Higher Education, which is for the three tribal colleges, is currently at uh, 495,000. Um, that's based in the most recent fiscal note, which uh, got a, a pretty accurate estimate of, of who those workers are. And, um, and so that's where that is. It, you would have to calculate it up, but I think it's 104 million. Representative Robbins. Thank you. So, um, can you just explain, I, part of my concern about this at the K-12 level, but also at the um, college level, is that there are a lot of summer job openings, and if people are eligible for unemployment, would they have to first apply for those job openings before they would be able to get unemployment, or if they're just in a seasonal or a calendar year contract, would they not have to apply? 
Representative Greenman. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Robbins. And this gives me an opportunity to show off to Deed how much I have learned about the unemployment insurance system, um, who is here um, and, and can serve as backup. Um, but this doesn't change any of the current rules of our unemployment system, which is you have to be available for work, you have to accept a job if it's, if it's a, a, a job that is uh, similar. And so as we talked about in K-12, as we talked about in workforce development, the reality is what we're doing, and this is why it's actually a staff retention um, uh, uh, it'll it'll help with staff retention is we're ensuring that workers who are on seven or eight or nine month contracts know that if they can't find a job in that summer month if they or if it takes them a couple of weeks when we hear about folks sometimes they get offered a job but it's only six weeks it's not the whole term that they'll have that they'll be able to fall back on uh, unemployment benefits if you're offered in and if you're offered a 12 month contract uh, um, great I think that that's what everybody would strive to and I think that that's what we heard uh, but if you're offered you know a com contract in that summer um, that you'd have to take that if it was the same or similar job Representative Robin. thank you mr. chair thank you for that um, and secondly I wondered you know at the k-12 level if it's not enough in the bill to cover it it would trigger um, the, the calculation of the levy but for higher ed if it's not enough if this appropriation is not enough to cover it how would that be it addressed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Robbins. And for the issue, the interest of brevity, we did not, in the last two committees, we actually heard some presentation on how I think, we think that this is a pretty conservative estimate um, based on the recipiency rates, based on uh, um, the, uh, the the average um, income calculated, that, that deed is calculated, but it's in the information we have. But what we know from Illinois is it was it's a lot less. And so I think actually what is more likely to happen is that the, this estimate is going to be high and it's going to come in under, um, especially at the K-12 level. Um, we, I, I think that I uh, would have to go back and look at it, but I think that we would estimate that it's about 35 uh, or between 28 and, and 40,000 or $40 million, not 132. Um, but, uh, um, and we did not add this testimony to this uh, uh, committee because we've heard it twice before. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that. If it if it does, if there's more appropriate than it is necessary, does it cancel back to the general fund or what happens to that money? Representative Greenman. Yeah, that is my understanding. Representative Robbins. One last question, sir. Um, thank you for all these great answers. Um, I just wondered if, if not you yourself, but someone from the, the different university systems could provide some data as we go forward on, you know, how many workers this would cover at each um, system and also how many summer jobs they have available that would be offered so we can have a, a little more data underneath this. Thank you. All right. Just one. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Robbins. And on that first part of the question, if you actually dig into the fiscal note, they do estimates based on their actual population of the folks that they anticipate being um, eligible. And there's actually some really good charts in here. So on the first question of who would be eligible, on the second question, I think uh, I would defer to folks from Min State and uh, the U of M to, to give you a better sense of the summer job situation. Representative Robbins. Representative North. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, thank you, Representative Greenman. Uh, this has been a work of love to make sure that we take care of those who take care of our kids. Uh, this is an overdue. Uh, that exclusion that has existed for many years, uh, I think it's time to end. Uh, one of the questions that I have is the schools and the colleges are considered to be reimbursing employers. And looking at the fiscal consideration, I see that there is an option of them becoming a tax-paying uh, employer. So uh, how will that really impact when we're looking at the fiscal? Uh, because I see that it was included in the fiscal note whereby I see that they could be up to 9% rate when we know that this, uh, you know, essentially the schools uh, reimbursing employers. So whatever we pay out is what they pay back. I just wanted to get that clarity. Um, Agreement. Mr. Chair, I think I'm going to bring up Deed. I think we anticipate pin, can, uh, that uh, folks will continue to be reimbursing employers in the way that we set up the um, uh, the unemployment insurance aid at both the state or at the higher ed and K-12 level anticipates that. But I think you're probably referring to something that was in the fiscal note and that probably came from uh, Department of Economic Development. 
Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Evan Rowe. I'm Deputy Commissioner for Workforce Services and Operations at the Department of Employment and Economic Development. And uh, did you hear the question? I, I did, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, so thanks, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Noor. Uh, the, the, that, uh, note in the, that piece in the fiscal note is just to note uh, just, a fact, uh, just a fact in UI law that um, reimbursing employers can choose to become, to become tax-paying employers. So that's just uh, you know, kind of a proviso that we put in terms of the analysis. We don't know that they would do that. We have no reason to believe that they would do that. It's just a, it's a, it is a thing that they could do if they chose to do it that, they're, you know, that, that would, have, that would um, you know, change the analysis a little bit, but we have no reason to believe that that would be the case. Representative Noor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Deputy Commissioner, for that response. Representative. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Representative Green, for, for bringing this bill forward. You know, I think in this committee we spend a lot of time talking about the workforce shortage, and I think one piece that we, we don't often talk about is that retention piece that, that Representative Greenman has referenced uh, multiple times. And, and we all know, of course, that it's much uh, more affordable for businesses and for everybody who has employees to keep an employee on rather than seek out new employees. So. Um, I think this really is a, a critical piece to that. And um, just, again, want to echo sort of the, the basic fairness argument, which I, you know, I, I recognize may not be the, the most powerful one for all of us, but it certainly is for me. Um, and then the, the last piece is, you know, too, we've talked about um, issues with, with regards to enrollment and, and um, some stories that have, have come up with, in particular, with regards to the Twin Cities campus at the University of Minnesota. And I certainly remember that Pioneer Hall story. And I, I have to think that um, as we think about sort of that public perception piece of why folks do or do not go to uh, a, a college or university, I would, as a parent, I would certainly think ability to feed my kids would rank pretty high up there in terms of things that I'm looking at. So um, I think this is just a, a really, really, really important piece. So just want to thank you for bringing it forward. Thank you. Any further questions, members? Representative Green. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members. And I really appreciate the the um, questions and the discussion. Uh, this bill has had a robust discussion at both the K-12 and the higher ed um, level. And I think sort of whether we're talking about our workers in our campuses or universities or in our uh, schools, the, the principle is the same, which is uh, we have unemployment insurance for a reason. It is to provide a economic safety net so that folks, um, if they're laid off or uh, lose their job for no fault of their own that they have that backup economic security that lets them stay on their feet, as you heard, pay their bills uh, um, and, and feed their families. And uh, this exclusion, um, which has been here for 80 years, is long overdue. We're, we're overdue in ending it, but I hope that uh, this is the year uh, that we do it. And I really appreciate uh, um, all your support, and I especially appreciate uh, the workers who've been after committee, after committee, after committee, telling their stories and telling how much they'd impact year after year. So. With that, Mr. Chair, thank you so much. I'm going to renew my motion that House File 20, as amended, be re-referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. Motion prevails. Thank you, Representative Greenman. Members, that concludes our work for today. Next week, I want to remind everyone we're going to start working on the omnibus bill, and we'll be making some motions for vehicle bills to the floor and to Ways and Means. So I'd appreciate a quorum. <laughs> and with that, meeting is adjourned.